Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. I'm Sandra Jones, and we're here today to talk about the outbound powered flyby excuse me, the return powered flyby that occurred earlier today. We're gonna start with a few folks that are gonna give some opening remarks and then we'll open it up for a question and answer session. This return powered flyby did commit Orion to returning back to Earth. But first I'm going to introduce our briefers. First up we have Mike Serafin, who is the Artemis mission manager from NASA headquarters. We also have Judd Freeling joining us, who is a flight director here at NASA's Johnson Space Center. We have Debbie Korth as well. She's the Orion Program Deputy Manager here at NASA Johnson. And joining us virtually is Melissa Jones, the Landing and Recovery Director at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. If you are a media personnel that is wanting to submit a question, you can do so by pressing star one to submit your name into the queue. If you do find your question has already been answered, you can press star two to remove it. And for our media here in the room, we'll also be coming to you. So I'm going to turn it over to Mike to give some opening remarks. Mike. Okay, well, good afternoon and thank you for continuing to follow uh, the Artemis program and the Artemis One mission. We are on flight day 20 of our planned 26 day mission and we continue to proceed along the planned mission profile. As uh, Sandra indicated earlier, we did successfully complete the return powered flyby and are now committed to an Earth return trajectory on, um, on the 11th. Um, as we've talked in the past, uh, we've had a, um, a number of commitments to each and every one of you and one of those involved uh, what we call sharing remarkable images. And if we could queue up a series of images here, we've got a, a brief collection. Uh, and this was taken on flight day six, is, um, is uh, the um, Orion spacecraft approached the moon and the, um, and the Earth is way off in the distance. Uh, you can see uh, eight million people off in the distance and a uh, human capable spacecraft uh, about to circle the moon in the foreground. And uh, this, is, this is one of those remarkable moments and remarkable images that we, uh, we got to share um, on uh, November the 21st. Uh, a little farther along in the mission on, uh, on flight day 13, we got to witness as Orion uh, flew about the distant retrograde orbit, which is the farthest point that a human capable spacecraft has ever flown. We got to see the uh, Earth transit behind the moon extending uh, beyond the pale of human spaceflight, uh, what a human capable spacecraft has done. And then uh, later today, or earlier today, uh, we got to see a, uh, a flyby of the moon um, uh, as part of the return powered flyby and, uh, and witness um, the, uh, the Earth rise <clears throat> for the first time in the Artemis generation. And, and here you see um, the Orion spacecraft um, near, near the point of closest approach. Uh, and then uh, this is the Earth rise uh, that, that we witnessed. Orion's in the foreground, uh, the Earth is in, in, the, uh, in the distant um, background and the moon is in the middle there and you see the crescent Earth. Um, you know, these are just a few of the remarkable images that, that we've been able to share throughout the course of the mission. Uh, when we are done with this mission, we will have traveled over 1.4 million miles in the course of the 26 day mission and we are on track to do that. In terms of activity within the mission management team, uh, since the last time I was here uh, to talk to you on uh, November the 30th, uh, we did not meet on Thursday, December the 1st, largely because the, mis the mission has been going well. We did meet on Friday, December the 2nd. We had a non-decisional meeting for about 40 minutes and we just um, status the progress of our, of our uh, flight test uh, objectives throughout the course of the mission and then uh, some of the anomaly uh, and funny um, uh, activities that we've been collecting along the way. We did not meet as a mission management team over the weekend on Saturday, December the 3rd or the 4th, largely again because the mission has been proceeding well. We did have um, a little excitement over the weekend that I'll talk to you about here in a few minutes. Um, but today we did have a decisional meeting. It ran just shy of three hours. And um, the uh, decision was to commit to deploy the recovery forces um, out of Naval Base San Diego. And our recovery director, Melissa, is here to talk to you about some of the preparatory activities and what's ahead there. 
uh, but we um, agreed to deploy the recovery forces on uh, December the 7th. And we also closed an action item as it pertained to some testing of what's called the pressure control assembly on the uh, service module that uh, the team had, um, had uh, asked to perform as part of the uh, uh, testing on the return leg. Uh, we also reviewed some anomalies from over the weekend. We did have a unplanned communications outage at the uh, Deep Space Network um, Goldstone site in California. There was a, um, a site-wide outage at Goldstone due to uh, some hardware uh, that's used to process the, um, the uh, uh, site um, and, and uh, antenna angles. Uh, that was recovered uh, last night, but on Saturday we did have a four and a half hour uh, comm outage. And uh, as part of that, I do wanna thank our, our friends and family in the Science Mission Directorate, as well as you know, our, our flight ops team and the, um, and the Deep Space Network team for uh, working together to uh, minimize the impact. Originally, when uh, we learned about the Goldstone outage, we thought it might have been up to an eight-hour outage, and it might, might have been more than one day. Um, but uh, because of our, our friends in the Mars programs, Perseverance, and then the, uh, and then the uh, Trace Gas Orbiter, um, uh, loaning us some of their Deep Space Network time, but then also um, through uh, the, the ops team and the Deep Space Network team working to mitigate the, uh, the site outage, uh, we only saw a four and a half hour outage on Saturday. Shortly after the uh, site outage, uh, we were um, proceeding uh, the flight team was proceeding through a uh, test of the power system uh, to further investigate a, um, a uh, funny that we had seen earlier in the mission, uh, a reoccurrence uh, a number of times on what's called a latching current limiter. And we were in a, uh, in a test configuration. And um, when we were in that test configuration, shortly after we came acquisition a signal on Canberra, after the Goldstone outage, uh, we noticed that, that four of the feeder um, current limiters had tripped off and it had dropped some of the downstream equipment there. So we talked through that today as a uh, mission management team. Uh, the, the spacecraft is fine. There's plenty of redundancy on the vehicle and um, that um, in combination with, with timely work by our operations teams um, uh, resulted in no mission impact and, and no, uh, no concern there. We did learn a, a few features um, about the system as part of that. So we talked through those uh, anomalies that occurred over the weekend. Uh, the Orion team in particular put in considerable time uh, over the weekend, as well as our friends at the Deep Space Network to, uh, to work through those anomalies. Um, as a mission management team, we will continue to meet this week. We still have one active anomaly resolution team. Um, we might hear the outbrief tomorrow uh, regarding the active anomaly resolution team, and it has to do with the power conditioning and distribution unit and these latching current limiters and, the, and some of the anomalies and funnies that we've seen throughout the course of the mission. And then uh, we have one remaining decision gate coming up um, that's a pre-planned decision gate, which is to select the landing site and our uh, entry flight director, Judd, as well as our recovery director, Melissa Jones, will come to the uh, mission management team on Thursday, uh, December the 8th, and bring forward a recommendation on where to uh, position our recovery forces um, and uh, to set up a meet-me date with the, uh, with the spacecraft from an entry trajectory standpoint, and Judd will elaborate on that further. Um, we still have a few primary objectives ahead. The mission is going very well. We've accomplished a number of bonus objectives above and beyond what we had planned pre-flight, um, but we still also have some risks ahead of us. We still have yet to accomplish the second half of our priority one objective, which is to demonstrate the spacecraft at lunar reentry conditions, and, as well as uh, our priority three objective, which is to retrieve the spacecraft post splashdown. So with that, I'll pass it back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Mike. Next up, we'll hear from Flight Director Judd Freeling, who was the flight director on console during today's return powered flyby at Bern. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, let's see if we can throw up the uh, the video that Mike showed previously about the pre uh, R uh, RPF video. I'll talk a little bit about that as we were coming into RPF today. Uh, so this is a great shot uh, coming coming in uh, before we we did our RPF uh, maneuver. Uh, you can see uh, kind of there in the, the lower mill there. Uh, we think that's the uh, Copernicus uh, crater there uh, that's, that's pretty near the Apollo 12 and 14 sites. And uh, we're just stunning video that we, what we captured uh, as we were about to, to go into LOS uh, for our RPF burn. Uh, so RPF uh, was the largest burn that we've done to date. 
Uh, it was a little over 962 foot per second burn, lasted three minutes and 27 seconds. That was on the backside of the moon. Uh, we had uh, an, uh, a loss of signal during that uh, time period. Uh, but then uh, as, as we came back, uh, AOS uh, at that time, and, and Mike showed that one, that uh, video as well, we saw a really outstanding uh, sh shot of the, the crescent earth and, and it was just, just stunning. Uh, the RPF move maneuver uh, that we did behind the, uh, the moon is essentially our deorbit burn. So this sets us up for uh, the landing trajectory that's gonna occur on December the 11th. Uh, where we have a fixed trajectory, and so this is what that trajectory is gonna look like. Uh, it's a little hard to, to make out, but the, the line in the middle of the page is a blue line uh, that we, we, will, uh, we will target our entry interface, which is at the bottom of this, this, this chart, uh, which is about uh, 3,500 or so nautical miles uh, south, almost due south of uh, San Diego. Uh, that, uh, that EI time we're targeting for 11.20 uh, central time on the 11th. And uh, we will perform a, a skip entry, uh, uh, entry, and uh, that'll show you uh, the next next slide uh, what that looks like from the, the side view. Uh, we just prior to entry inter interface, we will uh, separate the the crew module from the service module, and uh, that's about 20 minutes prior to EI. And then once we hit uh, entry interface or EI. Uh, will be about 40,000 feet above the Earth's surface, and that's the top of this, uh, the top left of this chart. Uh, we'll be traveling a little, uh, little over 24,500 miles per hour. Uh, we'll also lose signal uh, due uh, to the blackout of the plasma ionization uh, from the intense, um, intense uh, plasma that we're going through. This, this heat uh, that's going to develop on the, uh, from, from entering the atmosphere. That. Uh, that first blackout will last uh, about five and a half minutes. Uh, we'll continue down uh, for five and a half minutes. Uh, we'll, we'll dip down to about 200,000 feet, uh, and then we'll, we'll roll the capsule to create uh, a lift more uh, in the up direction. Uh, that will take us to our skip apogee, and uh, we'll gain, we'll gain uh, signal back right before that skip apogee. Uh, and uh, skip apogee is around uh, almost uh, 300,000 feet, it's at 292,000 feet above their surface. Uh, once we get to that, uh, that skip apogee, we'll uh, turn, roll the vehicle again and, and start uh, uh, modulating that lift vector back towards the earth. Uh, and then we'll develop on that downslope another uh, blackout due to plasma ionization. Uh, that will last uh, about uh, three minutes and 15 seconds or so. Uh, as we continue down, uh, uh, heading towards San Diego, uh, we'll, we'll go through various milestone points uh, along the way. Uh, by that 150,000 uh, foot mark, we'll be traveling about uh, 8,500 uh, miles per hour. Once we hit about uh, 100,000 feet, we'll be traveling uh, close to 2,400 miles per hour. Then by 50,000 feet, we'll be uh, a mere 528 miles per hour. And then for uh, our uh, four bay cover jettison, which uh, will will uncover the parachutes, the drogue chutes and the parachutes, uh, we'll be traveling about 285 miles per hour. And then uh, once we get our main deploy uh, of our chutes at about 5,300 uh, feet or so, uh, we'll be traveling about 128 uh, miles per hour. So there's a lot of numbers there, but uh, really you take, uh, take, take from, from 400,000 feet, you're traveling 24,500 miles all the way to splash down where you're traveling about uh, 20, 20 miles an hour. So it's a lot of uh, energy that we're dissipating at that point. Uh, as uh, as uh, Mike alluded to, uh, we'll, uh, prior to that point, uh, Melissa Jones and myself will, will find a meet me place for the recovery forces so we make sure that we're all uh, going to the same site. Uh, we do have the options of either landing a little short and, and that, that first slide that I showed you where we could land short up to 1200 uh, nautical miles uh, up range of San Diego or we can land a little long uh, in uh, what we call the northern uh, weather and alternate uh, site and that's uh, right kind of the cover of the Catalina Islands there, uh, just uh, to, the, to the southeast of those, those Catalina Islands. Uh, so we have a, a couple options. We have, uh, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C, uh, depending on the weather, uh, to make sure that we're not only within uh, capsule uh, landing criteria, but also that uh, we have uh, the recovery criteria that, uh, that Melissa and her team uh, are looking to recover the vessel. So uh, looking forward uh, to, to getting to the 11th. And uh, with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand it back to Sandra.
Thank you, Judd. Next up, we'll hear from Debbie Korth, the Deputy Manager of the Orion Program. All right, thank you, Sandra. Uh, good afternoon, thank you guys for joining us today. I'm really excited to continue talking about our Artemis mission. Um, as is mentioned, we are 20 days into our 26 day mission and uh, looking over the objectives on the spacecraft, we couldn't be more pleased about how the spacecraft's performing really beyond um, all our expectations. Um, as far as flight test objectives, we're about 30% complete with another 30% underway and the rest ahead of us, as we mentioned, a lot of those are tied to the reentry phase, the landing and recovery. Um, no major issues, as you've probably heard in some of these conferences, we've uh, added another 20 or so objectives because things were going so well, and, and most of those objectives are tied to looking at how we can expand the envelope and support our future missions. So Artemis One is just the beginning of a, a series of increasingly complex missions, and so we're really using this spacecraft uh, to, to really push the envelope and see what we can get in terms of performance for power and thermal and propulsion and all the other systems on the vehicle. So um, did want to talk a little bit about what we learned in DRO. You know, we spent a lot of time in DRO and went through a, um, several flight test objectives, added seven in that phase. Uh, a couple of key things that we did learn in that phase. Um, one is we did some uh, additional test objectives on our aux engines, and so we were looking at uh, longer burn times that we know we're going to need for future missions. So to execute Artemis One, the aux engines have only burned about 17 seconds at any one given burn, and we really need 100 seconds for some of these future missions. So spent a lot of time uh, burning that longer, looking at how that performed, and also looking at solar array uh, thermal effects with those longer aux burns. So really good, good initial look at the data there. Looks like we're about within 10 degrees of our predicts from pre-flight, and so, so no issues there in that thermal response. Um, another item that we looked at as far as looking forward to Artemis II was a uh, service module heater config test, and so we actually configured the heaters um, for both the prop line set points and the water line heaters to the Artemis II settings, and what we saw is significant 70 to 90 watts of power saving. So again, the vehicle, we're, not, we're, we're getting much better thermal response than we had originally anticipated in the model, so this will help us refine those models and be able to offer more capability as we move forward in, in the future missions. Um, so today we've talked about the successful RPF burn. Um, it's three minutes, 27 seconds. The Delta V was 961 feet per second, just almost spot on to what we expected the OMSI performance to be. And there's also been three um, a return trajectory correction burns that we've done as well, exercising the SMRCS um, system. So um, if you want to pull up the uh, goodbye to the moon video or picture, this is what we saw today as we were coming out of the of the um, uh, loss of signal, getting acquisition of signal. So I think you've seen this video and um, I think everybody in the room, we just kind of had to stop and pause and just really look at, wow, we're saying goodbye to the moon. It's been, it's been a phenomenal 20 days, but we got a lot of work ahead of us still. So, um, uh, see, I'll jump a little bit to uh, one of the main, I guess probably the primary anomaly that we are looking into. Uh, Mike talked about this uh, PCDU user load, the, the um, uh, latching current limiters that opened, four of the five that opened. And so, um, first of all, no mission impacts. There's a lot of redundancy in the system, and the, the systems performed as they had been designed uh, using that redundancy. But um, we did find that we had a couple impacts there. We um, First of all, the, the RCS string, when that when that power reset happened, uh, the flight software, as it's designed to do, says, well, we have to switch strings because the RCS isn't responding the way we had expected. Um, when that uh, uh, power drive electronics came back on, we switched back to the primary string, and what we found was that that was in a standby mode, so it wasn't actually able to fire the jet. So so long story short, we had six of the 12 RCS thrusters that weren't firing, um, but the but the team saw that in the vehicle response um, and able to, to command back to the um, uh, primary, the, the uh, string B of the RCS and continue with the firing, so, so no issues there. Again, showing we've got the redundancy in the systems we need. What we learned from that is we've got some fitter improvements that we need the flight detection ISO isolation recovery um, improvements that we need to do going forward on that, that system. Um, the other thing that we learned from that anomaly was uh, we had some heaters that were both tied, um, both primary and, and tertiary heaters that were tied to um, the single PCDU, and realized that when that PCDU went through this kind of power, this this kind of power anomaly, um, we uh, did, we wouldn't have had the redundancy that we thought in our heater system. So we've actually already uh, re rechannelized those to uh, give us back the redundancy that we expected to have in the system. So, so once again, um, I think that's probably the the primary um, anomaly that we've been looking. 
looking at, the, the team is working in the labs today and tomorrow to do some ground testing, uh, to look at maybe some proposed testing we might do on board uh, to kind of prove out what we think the root cause of these power upsets were. Um, so, so again, the, the vehicle was able to respond and we continued the mission, no issues, but we are looking at the next few days if there's something that we wanna do while we still have the service module, um, do some testing and first do that in the laboratory and get that on board in the next couple of days. Um, so looking ahead, um, we have a few uh, key things that we'll be doing on this return part of the mission. So um, talk a little bit about some of those objectives that we have planned. Uh, first of all is uh, one of those would be a, a solar array wing modal survey repeat. So we did a modal survey very early in the mission and um, have decided to add back a, a second one now the end of the mission to see how the structural modes have either changed or degraded potentially. Again, this will help further reduce our risk for Artemis II. This is a long mission with a lot of burns and so those solar rays have seen a lot of activity in terms of movement, and so this will give us a good indication of whether or not we see degradation over a 26-day mission. Um, we've also planned some new uh, 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 prop system leak test, and so on the MON and the MMH PCA branches, we have um, a latch valve and a couple of solenoid valves on each on each branch, and um, looking at actually confirming the leak tightness of those. We, we know what the leak rates were prior to the mission, and so we can actually go exercise those and see if we've seen any degradation there. Again, playing forward to um, how those are gonna perform on future missions. Um, so if you go ahead and pull up the image of the crew cabin, we haven't talked a lot about what's going on inside. We get these beautiful images of the moon. Um, so you've probably seen this, this image. This is a, from the crew cabin. You can see our Munican Campos, um, the Callisto payload and other activities going on. So um, as we're coming back in, we've talked a lot about our primary test objective on the reentry. So, so the one thing we are, are looking forward to tremendously is the heat shield test. And so this is the first flight of our block architecture heat shield. And we'll be getting uh, the first test of that coming in at 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the 25,000 miles per hour that Judd mentioned. Um, and so we'll, we'll see the performance of that and play forward for Artemis II and beyond. Um, parachute deploys, it's 11 parachutes that get deployed in a very rapid dynamic sequence, slowing that vehicle down from the 300 miles per hour to less than 20 when it hits the water. So definitely be looking at all that parachute performance. And then finally, our uprighting system. So the, the crew module does have these inflatable bags that help keep it upright, upright it if it, if it does flip over and then keep it upright. Um, so we'll see the performance of those as well. So all that'll be happening um, inside the, crab, the cabin here, you see the mannequin. Um, there's several things that we'll be getting data back on when we get the vehicle back. Um, the seats are, are instrumented with loads uh, or accelerometers, strain gauges, so we can get loads and vibrations data. So on that impact, when we hit the water, we'll actually be able to get the data on what, what how those loads are actually translating through the seat into the crew member. And also our uh, radiation payload. So we're flying some radiation protection vests on one mannequin. One mannequin doesn't have them, so we'll be able to actually see how was the radiation protection. You know, we get radiation environment data off of an item called HERA, but we won't have the actual vest data till we get down. So, so all those things are happening inside the cabin and we'll be able to get that data back uh, upon recovery. Um. So, and again, this is the, the first of many missions. It's not over yet. As you can see, we got a lot of objectives ahead of us, but I'm um, looking forward to uh, uh, that beautiful splashdown on the 11th. And so back to you, Sandra. Thanks, Debbie. Our final briefer today is Melissa Jones, who is the Landing and Recovery Director at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida, and she's joining us virtually today. Good afternoon. Um, the Artemis One recovery team is currently in San Diego. We've been here since a little bit after Thanksgiving. Last week, we performed our final mission rehearsal with the USS Portland, who will be the recovery team for Artemis One, the recovery ship, excuse me. We spent three days at sea with them. I think you have some video footage that was sent ahead of time. If you wanna play that, we can talk through some of that. But we had a great three days at working with them to refine our procedures and integrate our team so that we can meet the objectives of recovering the Orion spacecraft. You could see how they have a well deck um, underneath their flight deck on their, um, on their ship, which is really why we picked this ship to work with. And there's our mock-up capsule. And so what we do is we will um, watch the Orion splash down and go out and attach some line, lines to the capsule and and flood the well deck and bring that capsule in um, and put put it down in the cradle that's kind of hard to see there. So there's a lot of line management, but we, we had a great um, three days working with them. We started slow with line movement and a capsule movement in the, in the well deck. And, and the last day we did a full mission profile, which involves communication with the uh, mission control center and Judd's team, 
um, launching helica helicopters who are going to take all of the imagery and gather a lot of the flight test objective data that Debbie was talking about. Um, this mission is all about gathering data. And so the, the timeline for recovery will be approximately six hours as we um, capture a lot of that data um, for our flight test objectives. Um, we'll be very careful with the capsule, get about an hour and a half of imagery of that heat shield she was referring to before it touches anything in the ship. We want to make sure we document every bit of that so that we have the data that Orion needs to um, understand the performance of the capsule going forward. And then we'll very slowly do recovery into the well deck and um, bring Orion home. Um, and so we are ready and honored as an integrated team uh, to bring Orion home on the last leg of her journey. And thanks to all of our briefers for those initial remarks. As a reminder, we'll be taking questions on our phone bridge as well as here in the room. If you are on the phone, you can press star one to submit your name into the queue. And if you do find your question has been asked, you can press star two to remove it. Once your name is called, please state your name, your affiliation, and to whom you'd like your question to be directed to. But we're going to start here in the room with a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, uh, Mark Carroth, Aviation Week and Space Technology. Um, how would you sort of a re uh, assess or perhaps give a grade to the propulsion system overall uh, at this point in the mission? It seems like you've, you know, climbed uh, Mount Everest in a sense, and uh, but you know, there's still some to come and maneuvers. Uh, maybe not with the drama that you've done so far, but you want to get her back. So uh, I'm just wondering if you can. Offer it. <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll say as as the operator of the system, I'll give it an A. Uh, certainly, uh, this 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 uh, everything the vehicle has has asked for us to do, it's done, uh, and it's done phenomenally, right? So we've we've done all of the burns up till to this point uh, flawlessly. Uh, we've added some some extra tests on it, uh, even for the uh, for the plus X auxiliary engines uh, test that we did that performed flawlessly as well. So yeah, it's really, really great performance. I'm happy. I'm happy with it. I don't know, Debbie, if you, yeah, you want to say anything else. Um, second that vote. Uh, and thanks to our European partners uh, for their, their provision of that European service module. So that whole propulsion system is designed and built by ESA and Airbus and delivered to us and installed in our vehicle. Um, it's been great. And I think so we've mentioned we've added some objectives. We actually have another one on the part of the return leg that we didn't talk about. During the DRO, we did some um, tail to sun maneuvering of the OMZ to see, you know, if we could get a, a larger operating box on that tail to sun. And we're actually going to do a pure tail to sun on the way home um, because it, it is just performing really well. So um, I think because we haven't had to be troubleshooting anomalies or things, we've been able to look at how can we can expand that envelope. So it's been, it's been very good. Yeah. And Mark, for context, we talked prior to the mission that this was a stress test with Artemis 1. In order to get into and out of the distant retrograde orbit, we had to fly two large propulsive maneuvers to get in, two large propulsive maneuvers to get out, plus multiple correction maneuvers on the way out in the distant retrograde orbit and back. It is performed throughout. So um, in order to execute, as, as Debbie alluded to earlier, um, increasingly more complex missions throughout the manifest, we know we have to enter a lunar orbit, which requires a two-maneuver sequence, and exit, which requires a two-maneuver sequence. We successfully demonstrated that with the European Service Module throughout this flight. And we do have another question here in the room. Hi, Eric Berg with Ars Technica. A question, I think, for Debbie. But just on the uh, the power issues you were talking about, and I appreciate you sort of going into that, if there had been astronauts on board, would they have noticed anything now it's like colloquially like the lights flickering or you said mentioned something about the RCS you know it's thrusters not coming on but but what would they have experienced and, and would it have been handled automatically or would that have been some kind of consultation with mission control and is this and just sort of in addition to that is this something that's at all a concern as you look toward Artemis 2 or do you think that this is some kind of software issue or something like that can be addressed relatively easily. Yeah, I would say, first of all, we're not concerned. I mean, we think we know in the, the failure detection response uh, what we need to update there to make sure that it's picking up this standby mode of the PDE, which caused it to continue to try and fire these thrusters that actually couldn't be fired. But it was easily corrected and switched over to the other string, so, so no concerns there. Um, 
so in terms of what the crew would see, you know, I probably would have to lean on my FOD friends, but um, yeah, go ahead and answer. I answer that. So they certainly would be notified of the issue um, on their onboard displays, uh, caution warning displays. They, they would we'd certainly have a, a message, uh, but they would follow their procedure and it would tell them reclose these, uh, these latching indicators and we're all good. You know, in the meantime, they would have lost no capability. Our next question will come from the phone bridge, and it's from Bill Harwood with CBS. Uh, yeah, hi, guys. I appreciate this. But if I could maybe let Mike take a crack at explaining the anomaly. I mean, I realize it didn't have any effect on the mission per se, but um, I, I really don't understand what what the issue actually is. I mean, what's, what's the power control and distribution unit not doing? You know, what's being limited? I don't understand any of that stuff. If somebody could break it down into... High school terms for me. I'd appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, Bill, thank you for the question. And I'll, I'll probably ask Debbie and uh, for a little bit of help here on this one. But um, the, uh, the service module receives power that's generated through the solar arrays. The solar arrays, in turn, have these uh, latching current limiters that provide power um, into the uh, power conditioning and distribution units that are then distribute then distribute the uh, power throughout the uh, the, the uh, spacecraft, and um, when it's distributed, there are um, different um, avionics boxes or uh, power loads, and what we saw were four of these uh, feeder uh, current limiters that tripped off in, in close uh, sequence while we were in this test config. And the test config was we literally took one of the power conditioning um, and, and distribution units, and there's a uh, A side and a B side, and we isolated it to, to gather some more data. So normally there's a what they call a split tie across that, that A and B side within the, uh, the um, first power uh, conditioning and distribution unit. We split the bus into two separate bus ties, and then on the on the one B side, we saw all four drop on the on the power conditioning and distribution unit. And when that happened, all of the lower level power systems, or uh, all the lower level avionics, and in one case it was the uh, propulsion drive electronics, a redundant unit uh, that provides uh, drive electronics to uh, six of the twelve thrusters. Um, that also went to standby because it had dropped off, as well as some heaters, as well as a number of other lower level loads. So uh, we don't quite understand what caused the, um, the uh, 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 latching current limiters, in this case, to, uh, to trip, let alone that many in, in close proximity. Um, we're still gathering data on that. Uh, Debbie has an active um, anomaly resolution team within the Orion program. And I'll, I guess I'll pause there and see if you have anything to add on, on the description of the problem or, or any additional information. You no, know, I think that's a great description of the problem. And I kind of think of it as like you've got your, your power, I mean, if you look at your house, you've got a power supply company and then you've got a breaker box in your house. And so in this case, it's almost like those breakers opened. Um, and, and what it appeared is that they were commanded open, but there were no commands sent. So, so the question is, we're still in the middle of the investigation on why that happened. Um, so you still had power coming from the rays. You still had your PCDU. Um, you have two PCDUs, so you, know, you had your redundant systems working, but because those switches opened, you now have equipment that's looking for power that's not getting it, right? And so typically then your, your um, fault recovery system would switch to a system that can give it the power because we do have everything redundant. So not exactly sure on the root cause yet, and so the, the team's doing some testing in our um, offline labs today and tomorrow and then likely proposing uh, some tests that we can do on orbit later this week before, you know, we, we discard the service module, so we have a pretty limited window if there's anything we want, we want to do uh, before that happens. So, um, like I said, not sure on root cause yet, but that's kind of how, it, at a high level, that's how I hope that helped. Yeah, and, and Bill, one, one more point here. Um, you know, in your, in your house, a uh, light switch or a circuit breaker, that is the command device. You, you literally um, flip the switch and it closes the circuit, and that is the, the action or the command that does it. Um, what is a little bit odd to us is there's no record of, the, of a controller on board the vehicle sending a command to open the latching current limiter. So in your house, the device is the, is the command um, uh, object. In this case, there's a separate controller that tells the current limiter to open or close. 
um, and there's no record of, of, the, of the command device saying you should open or you should close, this thing is just open or closing without this box, the command device telling it to do so. So there's, there's some anomalous behavior here that we're trying to understand. Our next question comes from Gina Sensuri with ABC News. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you just run through the numbers for me? Uh, speed on reentry, temps, all of that stuff. Give me those numbers if you don't mind. Yeah. Sure, Gina, no, no problem. So uh, when we come into entry interface, uh, we're at an altitude of 400,000 feet, and we're traveling approximately 24,529 miles per hour. Uh, once we get to uh, skip apogee, which is about seven minutes, uh, seven minutes, 19 uh, seconds after entry interface, we're at an altitude of uh, 2,900, uh, or 2,091, 291,382 uh, feet, and we're traveling at 16,824 miles per hour. Uh, at 150,000 feet, uh, we're traveling approximately uh, 8,547 miles per hour. At uh, 100,000 feet, we're traveling uh, 2,398 miles per hour. At uh, 50,000 feet, we're traveling 528 miles per hour, and when we jettison the uh, the Ford Bay cover at approximately 22,845 feet, we're traveling uh, 285 miles per hour, and then our main shirt shoot deploy is a, is approximately uh, 5,320 feet, and that's uh, we're traveling 128 miles per hour, and then we uh, hit splashdown approximately 20 miles per hour. And, and just to add a point here. Um, Judd, I think you said 16.8 is the skip apogee velocity. 16.8 is just shy of what a vehicle, a spacecraft, comes back from low Earth orbit at. So um, this, that's our second dip into the Earth's atmosphere, is about what a, uh, a low Earth orbit vehicle would come back at it, which is 17,500 miles an hour. Our next question is from Brett Tingley with Space.com. Hi, this question, I guess, is for Melissa Jones. Um, it was mentioned earlier in this conference that uh, there's still a pre-planned decision gate ahead that will um, help select the landing site. I'm wondering, uh, by what metrics or what criteria are the different landing sites selected? So that's actually something that Jed Freeland and myself work on together, and it's um, mostly based on weather from my perspective, and there's, I'm sure, many other factors from the flight side, Judd, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Sure, Melissa. So we have a designated primary site that we try to land at first, and that's called San Diego Site 3. That's within uh, the Fleet of Hot area, which is the fleet training area, hot as in hot munitions. Uh, so that is uh, controlled by the Navy. So that's our, our first uh, target that we try to try to uh, to land at, uh, assuming that the uh, the weather and uh, criteria is all favorable, not only for the the hardware of the capsule, but also uh, for Melissa's team uh, to recover the capsule once uh, once it's in the water. Uh, and then we have various other sites within, as I mentioned, that northern weather and alternate that we could potentially go to uh, within the San Diego area uh, if the if the weather happens to be better uh, than our San Diego site three, and then. If none of those sites uh, look good to us, then we can always uh, go further up range along that track, uh, that uh, kind of south to north track that I showed you in my, my previous chart. Uh, anywhere, right, there, there, that's the one. Uh, so, so you've got a short distance there that's uh, around 1,200 nautical miles that, that we would still uh, be able to get our skip entry uh, objective for the, for the flight. Uh, and, and then, uh, the only reason we'd go any further up range of that is uh, if we had uh, something uh, wrong with uh, with our navigation system. Uh, we had inertial measurement units. If we had uh, more than two or two or more down, then we'd we'd uh, we'd either do a ballistic or a direct entry. So uh, all that to say. We look at the best weather along that track, and we find the best weather. Uh, if that best best weather happens to be uh, San Diego Site 3, we'll go there, and, and otherwise we'll, we'll find a better place to land um, 
within those criteria. And maybe expand on the weather just a little bit. It's it's wind speeds, but it's also wave height, wave period, um, because as we hit the water, how we you know how the capsule actually impacts that wave, what where its height is, what you're on the back side of the wave, the front side of the wave, how the winds all respond. So it's a pretty complex set of of uh, parameters that we look at to say that you need to stay within this wave height, this wave period, this wind speed. So that's that's how all that plays into where we finally select um, where to come down. We do have another question, this time from Alan Boyle with GeekWire. Thank you. I, I guess this question would be for Debbie. It's about Callisto. Can you say anything more about the performance of Callisto? And uh, is this something that you've decided uh, could be used on Artemis 2, or do you have to wait to see uh, what the performance is and what the objectives are for that kind of communication system? Yeah, so first of all, in performance, um, so far it's been really great. I've got to witness several of the, the sessions. Um, very, very interactive, you know, very engaging um, in terms of being able to talk to the spacecraft, you know, turn lights on and off, write notes, uh, play music, ask questions. It's just, it's a really uh, very good engagement um, opportunity and I think um, it has some potential on how we would use that further as a digital assistant or some other onboard activity. There isn't any um, specific plans for Artemis 2 yet. We're waiting to get back the data from this flight to see, you know, what, how it worked and, and what we can learn from how it performed. But, but so far, um, the performance has been really, really nice. Our next question comes from Jim McDade with 1819 News. Congratulations on uh, so breaking so many records on this mission. It's been spectacular. First of all, uh, yeah, I'm Jim McDade, uh, 1819 News and Verity Space News Clearinghouse. Um, <clears throat> Apollo 13 uh, set the reentry speed record back in 1970 after it got on its free return trajectory. And uh, I'm given to understand that that will be one of the last, if not the last, records that this Orion, uh, that this Artemis 1 mission and Orion uh, will break. Uh, will future reentry velocities be comparable, or is it possible there will be even faster? Or, or is this another example of you pushing everything to the limits in, in this uh, shakedown cruise? Uh, so let's see. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one. Uh, my expectation is that uh, the, the future missions for Artemis will be similar speeds uh, to what we're entering here, uh, uh, if not less. Uh, it, it's all going to depend on uh, the specific trajectory that we, we fly, and of course those are, are still being uh, developed for, for individual missions, but, but my expectation is that they will uh, likely no be, be no larger than the speeds that we're entering uh, for Artemis 1. Yeah, I think we definitely have some limitations or, or requirements on our heat shield, and so when we look at the reentry, part of the skip reentry is getting us slow enough down um, so that the heat um, gets down. So I think when we look to futures, I, I know we're trying to expand the skip distance um, for future missions, um, but I don't think that's going to affect the speed much. Our next question comes from Sophie Sanchez with Cosmic Chicago. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is for Debbie. You mentioned a couple of system configurations set for Artemis II that you've already tested. Um, I was wondering if there were any um, that you were planning for the duration of the mission on the return home, um, any systems that you were planning on testing for at the Artemis II settings? Thank you. I don't know specifically if we're testing Artemis II settings on the way home, but there's a lot of things that we are testing so we can expand the operating box that Artemis II can operate in. So things I mentioned like the, the solar array mod, uh, modal survey, uh, understanding how the, the solar arrays degrade over time, um, these, these uh, pressure control assembly within our prop system, leak checks, you know, how do valves uh, behave over time. Um, this OMZ, we're, we're orienting to tail to sun directly to see how we can get more performance out of the engine. Um, there are some mixed string uh, RCS firings we're going to be doing on the way home. Um, so there, there's a lot of objectives, not specifically putting things in Artemis II configuration, but driving the system beyond maybe where we thought we were going to operate for Artemis I so we can expand that box. And, and Debbie, I'll, I'll add to that, uh, you know, this is really the start of a campaign of, of several missions uh, to, to, to get uh, humans back to the moon and beyond to Mars. Uh, 
for Artemis, Artemis II, there, there's still a lot of things still to test for Artemis II. Uh, we don't have a life support system on Artemis I, and so that's going to be the major objective for Artemis II is to test that life support system. Uh, we'll also be testing um, rendezvous and prox, uh, prox uh, operations, in other words, uh, rendezvousing with another vehicle when we're, we uh, we're rendezvous with the, the, uh, the interim uh, uh, cryogenic propulsion stage on Artemis II. So, so there's still a lot to be done, and, and this is just the beginning. Sophie, I'll just give you two more uh, as part of a preview for um, entry, descent, and landing day that we're planning for here on Artemis One, and, and I think both these happen on Judd's watch operationally. Uh, one is an aerothermal um, test during um, the uh, entry, descent, and landing where we fire, deliberately fire all of the uh, reaction control system thrusters in, in, in various um, um, points during the reentry profile to gather, gather um, um, hypersonic um, aerothermal data as we fire those thrusters. And then post splashdown, we're deliberately going to keep the vehicle powered, um, assuming the vehicle is healthy, for two hours after splashdown to understand how much heat has soaked back after, after that peak heating of up to 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit outside the, um, outside the vehicle. Um, the, as the heat shield protects the vehicle, there's still going to be uh, heat that soaks into the structure that is the Orion capsule. Uh, it'll splash down in the ocean. The ocean's going to cool the vehicle, but some of that heat is going to be resident in the structure of the vehicle. So we want to understand how hot the cabin's going to get. So we'll leave the vehicle powered for two hours, keep it on the cooling system for two hours to understand for astronauts on the very next mission. Um, what the temperature profile in the cabin is going to look like. So um, that's part of that six-hour um, uh, recovery time frame that, that Melissa highlighted earlier. That we're deliberately going to wait um, for two hours with the vehicle powered on the surface of the ocean. So those are some of the things that are ahead of us as well. And that was the final question that we received this evening. So thanks to all who submitted questions as well as our briefers for joining us in a busy time. Next up, we continue to look forward to Orion's return home. We'll have another briefing this Thursday at 4 p.m. Central, where we'll go over that return in a little bit more depth. And we'll also be covering Orion's entry, descent, and splashdown beginning at 10 a.m. Central on Sunday, December 11th. But until then, be sure to follow along with our daily blog posts as Orion continues its journey home at blogs.nasa.gov Artemis. Thanks again for joining us. That will wrap up today's briefing.